Okay, uh, I had a couple of good questions during the break that I thought I'd talk about. One of them was uh, from somebody who does Raman. And up here I showed uh, delta j equals plus or minus 1. And, uh, and I was asked, uh, how can that be? Because in Raman it's equal to plus or minus 2. It's true. Delta j can't be plus or minus 1 in Raman scattering. Uh, two things about that. In a little while we'll talk more about the real world more of this, the real world doesn't actually behave like this simple model, and you can easily get delta j equals 2. The other thing is that th this particular formalism is for a transition from one energy level to the next. Okay, that doesn't happen in Raman. And that's why, that's part of the reason why Raman can't actually have delta j equals plus or minus 1. With Raman, the solution is different, and you get a different uh, set of transition rules for Raman. But it's a good question. Um, so yeah, th and actually that sort of highlights that we've been talking about uh, a somewhat, uh, what would you call it, narrow or, or focused or uh, we, we've been carving off a particular subject here which has more to do with transitions, actual transitions, transitions in population from one state to the next. A lot of things can happen in molecules that don't actually involve that. But the spectroscopy that we use, like uh, absorption and fluorescence, do use that. Raman doesn't. The other question was, and that's a good one because I've never thought about that before, how does anybody know that the, that the electron's not actually spinning? I don't know. I never thought about that question before, but it's a good one. I know that uh, Dirac did a relativistic solution that actually predicted all of these uh, electron behaviors that we've been talking about and calling spin. And maybe when he did that, I've never actually looked at that solution because it, it just didn't bother me. I don't know why. But, uh, yeah, the, so the Hamiltonian bothers me, but the spin thing doesn't. I don't know. I can't explain things sometimes. But uh, I suspect that the Dirac solution probably showed that you can predict these things without having rotation of the electron. I suspect that's where that came from, but I don't really know. It's a good question. Any other questions before we get going? Okay. So today we want to talk about electronic states and how do they couple between uh, the nuclear modes. Uh, and then we want to talk about OH, the UV spectrum of OH. It's probably the most important molecule in combustion. One could argue that, that the oxygen atom, for example, is equally or possibly more important, but that one's way more difficult to measure. OH gives you good strong signals, so we all love OH, so we'll talk about OH. So this is a continuation of the last lecture. We're going to continue that discussion, and I just want to remind you of two things. I, I said that it's difficult to calculate the electronic states, okay, and typically rely upon uh, measurements, okay, and we assume that the lowest state, the X state, has zero of energy, and we just go up from there based on the uh, delta E's that we measure spectroscopically. We also said that there can be rho vibrational transitions during an electronic transition. And then this ER, this was the potential field that we used in the nuclear solution, which has to do with the electronic state. That's going to change between those two. And that's part of what makes the, the electronic transition, the electronic spectra, more complex. So these rules for electronic transitions, they're going to depend on each molecule, how the various modes couple to each other. So you can't actually generalize. From, from here on out, we actually sort of stopped generalizing a little bit at the end of the last lecture where we started talking about third order uh, corrections and so on. Well, those all depend on which molecule you're talking about. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to reach the point where each molecule has got its very specific characteristics. So for electronic transitions, again, we have the X state, which is the lowest level. Then we have the A state, B state, and so forth. This, I actually purposely drew, these are all cartoons I drew, but this one I purposely drew it so it had a slightly different looking uh, potential well shape. And you notice that it's shifted over a little bit. Those can, those can, somebody was asking about uh, the uh, Frank Condon factors. That can have a big effect on the Frank Condon factors, as you'll see. This means that this potential energy function is different for the two states, 
And then that means that the uh, vibrational and vibrationally dependent rotational coefficients are going to be different between those two. So there's going to be a completely different set of rho vibrational coefficients between the two electronic states. So as before, we can uh, write the term energies this way, but now we're going to involve the electronic transitions and these expressions that we've already uh, worked out, but they will change. So most importantly, this F, the, that's the rotational energy, we're now going to have to include the rotational contribution of the high-speed electron, the orbital angular momentum of the high-speed electrons, and that's going to turn it into a total rotational energy level, F with a different J, the, the times Roman J. So we talked about uh, solutions to the one electron atom, and we talked about electronic orbital angular momentum along Z, and it had a magnetic quantum number M sub L, and a total electronic orbital angular momentum quantum number L, right? We had those two, and the atomic shells were called SPDF for L equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so all that. All that. Both the M and the L enter into selection rules for transitions, and we're going to see all of that repeated. That pattern is going to be repeated this time. Z is going to be the internuclear axis, and we're going to see the same kind of things happening. Molecule has a lot of electrons, not just one, and we have to combine their contributions into an aggregate electronic behavior, which makes it a lot more complicated, which is why uh, there actually there is some fairly complicated uh, analytical math for a multi-electron atom. People try to do the same thing for molecules, and then they, they kind of wander off the edge of a cliff, so they try to like, combine two different approaches to the thing and merge them a little bit and so forth. It's all actually kind of ad hoc, and uh, yeah, you, you wander past the Prandtl number to the 0.5 power when you do that. In this case, mismatched nuclei form a natural charge distribution, so that makes a natural z-axis. And then we talk about this total, or aggregate. I, I like the word aggregate because it sort of implies a sort of an average behavior. We're going we're to sum all these things together and come up with an aggregate behavior of the electron cloud. It has a, a, a total orbital angular momentum we denote by L, which is a vector with a quantum number L. And I'm showing them here. There's the quantum number. That, that, uh, that's the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the uh, component of L along the z-axis. So L precesses around z, around that axis. And it gives rise to a component along z called this lambda. And lambda has a magnetic quantum number m sub L, which we talked about before, actually. And you notice that we use, in the molecular uh, world, we use either capitalized or Greek letters that are the same as the letters we used with the one electron atom. So the magnitude of lambda along the z-axis can be given, is given by m sub L times h. That's almost exactly like the one electron atom. And it can be equal to these things, which is similar to the one electron atom. So similar to the atomic solution, we had SPDF for the electronic states here. We designate them by sigma pi delta phi for m sub L equals 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so it's like SPDF. Remember earlier I said something about a sigma state? That's what that means. Sigma states are for m sub L, or the absolute value of m sub L, or lambda equal to 0. The energy changes with lambda. I'm sure you've heard of these designations before, sigmas and pi's and so on. That helps to establish the energies of the x and the a states. And when you start to read about these things, you go, wow, it might seem like that. At least it did to me at first. That this just goes on forever. This is a huge subject. But uh, it's not that big. So there are, there are L plus 1 distinct states, including the 0 there, with different energies for each value of L. And as I say, it sounds like a lot. But the truth is, there are just a few of those states that matter to us. There are only two for OH. So it's not an infinite number here. We only look at a couple of them. For uh, NO and CH, we look at only about four of them. So it's not like there's an infinite number of these Ls that we have to worry about, even though they can you know, potentially, theoretically, go out past that point. They don't matter to us. So it's really, even though this sounds like it balloons out forever, it's really fairly contained. 
Lambda also controls uh, how the electronic and nuclear rotation affect each other, and they call that coupling. We use the absolute value of ML. Now let's go back to what ML is equal to. The absolute value of ML can be equal to 0, 1, 2. This is one of those things, just like with the atom, where uh, this thing can point down in negative directions or up in positive directions, which is why we use the absolute value. Right? So you can switch sign. So the two states are usually degenerate or nearly degenerate. That's called lambda doubling. So there's actually two potential directions for that lambda, which is why it's called lambda doubling. Uh, and if they have the same uh, energy level, they're called degenerate, but sometimes they can be split. And here in the NO they are. So the nuclear rotation in, ni in nitric oxide can set up a small magnetic field that's actually splitting these two lines from each other. And uh, can you see those? If, if the lines have really broad bandwidth, then They'll lo it'll just look like a strangely broadened line. It won't fit exactly the expression you're used to talking about when you talk about lines. So sometimes with nitric oxide, it'll be so broad, it, it doesn't actually fit a Voigt profile. It looks kind of funny, and that's because there's actually two lines right there near the peak. But, but uh, you're only observing one peak, so you, call that, you might call that degenerate. If you can actually split the two lines with the technique you're using and you can see the two lines, then you treat them as individual lines and you don't call, each, you don't call either one of them degenerate. Note that the sigma states with lambda equals zero don't have lambda doubling and they don't have the degeneracy. I'm starting to talk a little bit about degeneracy because it starts to matter when you use Boltzmann statistics. Yeah, Boltzmann statistics is about counting up energy levels. And as I said, line broadening and instrument broadening can sometimes uh, obscure those uh, uh, features. And when that happens, we call them degenerate. I remember when I, was, uh, when I first went to graduate school, um, people typically did not use lasers to study nitric oxide. Uh, they typically looked at nitric oxide emission, chemiluminescent emission from, say, a flame, and they would disperse it in a spectrometer, and the spectrometer never had narrow enough uh, line widths to actually separate out the lambda double doubling and so you got these peaks and people just called them degenerate and I could still remember so my thesis advisor was doing diode laser absorption that was the first time that people did that I go way back don't I um, and I still remember the excitement when they actually they, they showed a paper where they were actually clearly showing the lambda doubling because the diode laser was so narrow band it was one of the first times people had seen that in a thing like a flame Okay, back to electron spin. Now, I just uh, repeated from what, what I said last time, is that there, there's an intrinsic uh, angular momentum behavior to an electron. So we have to worry about uh, electronic spin. There's a spin quantum number, one half. We can have a component along z, up or down. And to populate the shells, we just add spin in unmatched pairs. I remember doing that when I was a senior in, no, a junior in high school. I thought that was cool. So the resultant spin of all the electrons in a molecule will be integral if there are an even number and half integral if not. The component of total spin along the internuclear axis is designated sigma. And it's extremely unfortunate. For some reason in this world, people keep doing that. There's, there must be millions of other variables they could use, but they keep repeating variables like mu. Mu is used for almost everything. And here sigma is used for lambda equals zero but it's also used for the spin component along the internuclear axis. Sigma is used for both. Uh, in these notes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it sigma sub s, so you know that's the spin-related sigma. As people don't normally do that. So the spin-related sigma along the uh, axis can be equal to these different s's. We're getting components again, right? There are thus 2s plus 1 values for that. It depends on how many electrons you have participating in this behavior and how each one of them is, is uh, contributing. So we want to find the total electronic orbital plus spin angular momentum. That's just for the electron now. We're not including the uh, nuclear orbital angular momentum yet. So we have to sum along the z-axis to give this. So that's omega is the sum of those two contributions, the orbital and spin electronic along the z-axis. 
Now we have to think about how does omega couple to uh, the nuclear orbital angular momenta. So there is an unusual case that, uh, I'm not sure why, but my thesis advisor likes to talk about this. I, I've never actually studied a molecule. Well, I suppose because he does uh, infrared stuff a lot, maybe he runs into it more often. Uh, during purely rho vibrational transitions, when the electron orbital has a big effect on the moment of inertia around Z, now remember the Z is the one that's uh, connecting the two nuclei, and normally it has a very small rotational moment of inertia, but sometimes the electrons can couple to that strongly, and that'll change the behavior because now it's going to look more like the other axes. When that happens, you get what's called a symmetric top correction, and you get a rotational energy that's expressed this way, where that's the symmetric top correction. Otherwise, uh, when the electronic orbit couples to the internuclear axis, it can affect the rotational contributions to an electronic spectrum, which makes sense. This is called uh, Hun's coupling cases, and you, you'll hear a lot about that when you go to a diagnostic talk or something like that. People will sometimes launch into a discussion of these coupling cases. And these are really, um, they're explanations of observations. Uh, it's, a, it's an informed way to explain what has been observed spectrally. So what this, the, the diatomics that we talk about in combustion, they usually fall into Hun's cases A and B. So those are the only two I'll talk about. And most combustion diagnostics books only talk about Hun's cases A and B, but there are more. So once again, uh, when we try to combine nuclear and electronic, we have a problem because we've been using L for both. I don't know if you noticed that. It, it, can, it can tend to be pretty confusing. We used L for the nuclear and we used L for the electronic for both orbital angular momenta. I don't know why people like that. I mean, I'm just repeating the notation other people use because it's important to keep using the same notation. If you don't, people start to wonder, what are you doing? Is it? The thing about that is, in, in, in our world, people use, uh, uh, why am I talking about this? I have, I have graduate students who can't stand this. I, I say to them, no, use those words. And they go, everybody uses the, so the same words. It sounds silly. We're all using the same words. And I want to use these other words. The trouble with using the other words is people start to wonder, why did this person specifically choose to use an unusual word? They must mean something different from what the usual word is. And you can really confuse uh, readers if you aren't careful. So that's why I think it's important, even though these uh, are confusing, to keep using the, the, the notations that other people use. So I don't like it myself. I, uh, this business of using capital L for both the nuclear and the electronic, I think, is, uh, is kind of crazy, but it's very old. Happened a long time ago. People are still doing it, so we should do it. But in this case, I'm going to depart from that because I don't like it. I'm going to use R to designate the nuclear term. So we had a capital L when we did the nuclear solution. I'm going to call that R here so you can see that there's actually a difference between R and L. So Hun's case A, we're going to assume that there's an interaction between the nuclear rotation and the electronic angular momentum, but it's weak. It's very weak. So the nuclear rotation is represented by R. So this thing is rotating that way in this picture, right? It's rotating around that way. Uh, and, it, and it's got a, a, an angular momentum that's sticking out that way. And we're going to say that this omega, which represents the electronic. Now remember, the electronic omega is uh, uh, a representation of lambda, which is the expression of the electronic orbital angular momentum along z, plus sigma, sigma sub s in my case, which is an expression of the spin momentum along z, and it's the sum of those two, OK? So what we're going to say is the connection between this and that are weak. And in, in addition, the electronic is strongly coupled to z, which is what I'm showing here. The lambda and the sigma just line right up along z. So that if you think about it, there are a lot of permutations here. Maybe spin doesn't couple so strongly to z. Maybe lambda, it does couple strongly to z. Maybe neither one of them couples strongly to z in the case of a particular observation. So that's why there's so many Hun's cases. So this is a specific case. 
So R is strong, not coupled to uh, the electronic. The electronic is strongly coupled to Z. So L, which is the uh, orbital angular momentum, and S, which is the spin, they precess independently about Z. So we have an omega. We have projections lambda and sigma. They had to give omega. So there's a well-defined quantum number for the electronic motion uh, that we use, omega. So in this case, the total angular momentum is given by j is equal to r plus omega. Now this is the j with the quantum number here, j equals r plus omega. That's the j we're going to use in the expression for rotational energy. That's why it matters, because obviously that's going to change it quite a bit. So the rotational energy for Hund's case A is usually given this way, F sub J for this J, which is the two of them. Is that there's a, this looks familiar, right? There's this plus this term here, and then here's the first order correction controlled by the spin expression along the internuclear axis. For a molecule that looks a little more like a symmetric top, it's written this way. Hund's case B. Now the spin and the electronic orbital angular momentum are not coupled, okay? So we still have the electronic orbital angular momentum and it's coupled to Z, but there's no spin along here because the spin is not paying attention to Z. Okay, it's actually coupling to R. So S does not precess around Z. It remains fixed in space and we're gonna add that to R. So now we have a new angular momentum vector, which is combining the spin and the R vector. So we get N. N is the combination of those two, S and R. So here's R, there's S, wait, S, 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 where's S? N is, N is gonna be the combination of those two. Uh, oh, lambda and N, sorry. And that's gonna give us a, a new lambda and R, sorry. S is gonna couple to N. So R and lambda couple first, and then S couples. Sorry, I got that backwards. So then we get a total rotation, which is N plus S. In other words, S is kind of like not coupled to anything until the end. It's, it's there, it has to be included, but it's not going to be connected to the other phenomenon. So Hunt's case B is very common in free radicals like we see in flames. The energy formulas for Hund's case B molecules are different from one to the next, okay? They're similar to what we've discussed, but uh, it's actually fairly complicated. It's lots of special cases. And what this gets at is, is that we're beginning to radically depart from fitting to Prandtl number to the 0.5, right? We've noticed lots and lots of things that don't follow exactly what we've been observing in terms of the expressions you know, with the simple-minded expressions we developed, we observed that they would do these things. Well, they don't actually, so now we're adjusting them to make them repeat what happens in the real world. The energies add up. So the spectral lines for electronic transitions can be found by summing terms, okay? So once again, so th th if this is for a transition, right, that's a wave number, nu on C, it's just the difference between these different term energies. That's the position in, uh, in wavelengths. These are selection rules for diatomic molecules in Hund's cases A and B. So delta J is zero or plus or minus one, but we can't allow, this means you can't allow, you can't have J going from zero to zero. And actually delta J equals plus or minus two is allowed. Those are called O and S transitions. They're weak next to the P, Q, and R branches, but they're there and people have studied them. There's no restriction on delta V. That you can change the vibrational uh, quantum number however you like, but this, we've been mentioning this name, Frank Condon. Frank Condon principles apply. That'll be in the next uh, lecture. Parity has to change during a molecular electronic transition. In other words, the wave function has to transition from symmetric when reflected through the center of mass to anti-symmetric or vice versa. You can't leave it as it was. If you, th if you just think about it, um, they're going to be two different wave functions in an integral and they're going to cancel each other out unless it does that. For the electron, 
delta L can be zero or plus or minus one. Remember, that's the expression of the electronic orbital angular momentum along Z. Delta S is zero for a transition this is. In Hund's case A, the expression of spin along the axis, uh, delta change in that has to be zero, and this omega, which was uh, L plus sigma, uh, can, all, can be zero or plus or minus one. In Hund's case Bn, delta N, which was R plus uh, lambda, can be zero or plus or minus one, except delta N equals zero for transitions between two sigma states. It gets very complicated, very quickly. It's important to keep track of degeneracy because it affects the Boltzmann statistics. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about what are the heights of these lines. Well, they have to do with what's the population in the level that's being addressed by the laser. The laser is targeting a level. How many molecules are in that level? That's given by Boltzmann statistics, and we have to worry about degeneracy. So the electronic degeneracy is described by this, 2s plus 1 times phi. Unfortunately, we're using phi again. Uh, phi equals 1 for uh, lambda equals 0, and phi equals 2 for lambda not 0. In other words, a non-resolved lambda double level or resolved. Vibrational levels are not degenerate. For rotation, Hund's case A, the degeneracy is given by this. In Hund's case B, it's given by that. For heteronuclear molecules, the two uh, nuclei are different. Nuclear spin degeneracy is given by this. For homonuclear molecules, it's not a simple formula. Now, uh, when I was studying uh, for a PhD, I never heard anything about uh, nuclear degeneracy, and maybe that's happened in your life as well. Nuclear degeneracy matters for Raman scattering. For uh, spectroscopy like this, when we're looking at population transitions, the, the nuclear degeneracy cancels out of the, the partition function and the uh, the, the upper term in the, in the fraction, the, the Boltzmann fraction. And so typically, in some worlds, they don't even talk about nuclear degeneracy because it'll cancel out ultimately. So when they, when they give you a, uh, an expression, say, for a partition function, they'll just not mention the nuclear degeneracy that might go in there. So I had never heard about it until I started to study Raman scattering. But there is a nuclear rotational degeneracy. So spectroscopic notation, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time on this. I just wrote it this way, where each one of these things stands for something you see in the notation. So this diamond represents a letter designating which valence electronic level it's in, X, A, B, C. You've seen that before. Starts with that. So the ground state, first electronic state, second electronic state, and so forth. 2s plus 1, that's just the spin. That's called the multiplicity. That's a degeneracy caused by spin. This delta here represents the designation for the value of lambda. In other words, sigma pi, delta, etc., for lambda uh, along the axis of 0, 1, and 2. This little diamond up here is a parity designator, plus for symmetric and minus for anti-symmetric. And then this down here is equal to that when there is spin coupling in the internuclear axis. A lot of times you don't see that written down. So here's an example for OH. The first electronic state is designated by A squared sigma plus. The uh, subscript is, is left off, uh, but it's irrelevant in this case because uh, in, it's a, irrelevant in the Hund's case B molecule, and the OH A state is Hund's case B. So it doesn't do that kind of coupling. The ground electronic state for OH is designated this way, x squared pi. There is no plus or minus right? Because the state is lambda doubled and one of those states is plus and one of them is minus, so it's left off. Transitions are labeled using the designators like these, okay, with a lower level to the right and an arrow indicating which direction. So this would be absorption from the ground electronic state to the first ex elec excited electronic state. So that's what that notation means. The vibrational band notation for a transition is just written this way, with the upper state and then the lower state. Rotational notation uh, is written this way with these symbols again. So this, the very first one, is S R cubed, depending on uh, what delta N was. But when delta J equals delta N, or when delta N makes no sense for the coupling case, 
that's left off. Okay, the next one is that, the big diamond, that's SRP, those, uh, for delta J equals plus two, plus one, so forth. Alpha and beta are related to Hun's case B. Alpha is used for the upper level, and, and alpha equals one, two, three, four, this case. And beta is the lower level for these cases. When alpha equals beta, only one value is written. So one could say that the P18 line, that's the rotational transition, right? That's for delta J, that's for the alpha and beta, they were equal to each other, and eight was, what is it again? Uh, what the J double prime was of the zero, zero band of that electronic transition. So that actually tells you all the necessary information about the different s states that were observed, the transitions between the states. Those details are different for each molecule. So I can't, I can't give you uh, uh, like a little uh, spreadsheet or something that'll just figure out what to say, right? You just can't do that because they change for each molecule, partly because the coupling changes for each molecule. So we went through a whole lot of stuff about these states and transitions and stuff like that. Uh, there are a lot of articles on how do you perform something like laser-induced fluorescence, okay, under a lot of different conditions. And, and uh, there are review articles and there are textbooks and so on. If you're actually following uh, uh, you know, a prescription that has been published by somebody who's done very good work and understands what they're doing and it's been used before by other people under the same kind of conditions that you're doing things, you don't really have to get into all these details. You can just use the prescription if it's one that's been accepted by the community. Um, in that respect, doing, say, planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging, that's done a lot for OH, and a lot of people use very specific transitions and so forth, and there are very specific reasons for looking at those transitions. Uh, you know, it's a good way to reject background noise and all these other things. It's been proven many times to be reliable. That's almost like doing PIV with a commercial instrument. It's just that you had to buy the laser and the optics and set that up yourself, but you're following a formula, a prescription that was written by somebody and, and the whole community has decided that is the best way to do it. It's fine to just do that and not worry so much about all of these details. But the point is that if you are going to end up looking at a molecule other people haven't looked at so carefully, you, you better start to look into it and, and figure out what are the details and maybe what is the right way to do this and so forth. So let's talk about OH. This is actually the same spectrum I was showing you before. It's just structured in a nice way because I stole this from my advisor. Um, so this is the OH, uh, A squared sigma to the X squared pi. This is at 2,000 Kelvin. That's the, we always report the temperature because that changes the populations and the levels, right? So remember that the P, Q, and R stand for delta J equals minus one, zero, and plus one, and those subscripts are related to the Hun's case B coupling. So this is uh, part of the spectrum for uh, around 300 nanometer for OH. And they're, they're stick spectra, so there's no line broadening in there. And as I said before, every molecule is different. What I'm going to tell you now does not apply to the other molecules, OK? All I want to do is show you an example, and it's the most important example, so that you can see what's involved in, in talking about what goes on. How, how complex can this be? So how do you find out about OH? How, where, did, where did we get the information that goes into that? Well, uh, there's a lot of published uh, locations. The Hertzberg books has a lot of information about OH. You know, the nice thing about OH is uh, it hasn't changed. <laughs> you know, Hertzberg's not even alive anymore, but OH hasn't changed. Uh, some people have managed to measure things with more fidelity, though, so sometimes there's better, newer information. Deakey and Crosswhite is actually, I, I did OH in my thesis, and I used this paper by Deakey and Crosswhite. It's fairly old, but it has a lot of great information about OH, and that's actually built into this database. Have anybody here ever heard of LiftBase? Yeah. LiftBase is great. Uh, it's unfortunately, they're having a hard time supporting it, but LiftBase actually contains, if there's, if there's information that's updated past Deakey and Crosswhite, it's in LiftBase, and they will give you the, the citations to where to find that. So it's, it'll actually, uh, LiftBase will calculate for you 
a fluorescent spectrum, not just for OH. It's, it's a really nice database. It's from SRI International. It's a research lab in Menlo Park, California. So if you do not have lift base, you should go get it, because if nothing else, you can learn a lot just by playing with it. In fact, uh, in the, at the end of the last lecture, I showed uh, an OH spectrum that was similar to the one I just showed, but it, was, it just had the purple lines. That was from lift base. I just banged that out really fast and put it in there. Uh, and then you can find those citations in the lift base uh, handouts and so forth. Electronic term energies for OH are measured and vibration is straightforward, so let's get rid of those first. The full expression for vibrational term energy is given in this equation here. You see we're using all three of the terms. And actually these values for omega and x you'll find uh, published in the lift base manual. You'll find them in uh, Deakey and Crosswhite. You'll find them in a lot of places. Okay, rotations and coupling. This is a little more complicated, so well, let's start with the excited state the sigma state. The A state follows Hunt's case B coupling. Remember that one? This is the one I got flummoxed on. This is the one where the, uh, the coupling of electronic orbital angular momentum to the z-axis is strong, but spin is like, spin is, is left the ranch. There, there's the uh, uh, rotational, the orbital angular rotational momentum of the nuclei. Those two couple to give you N, and then they couple to S to give the total J, okay? So in Hun's case B, N can be equal to 0, 1, 2, uh, up to R. Lambda equals 0 in the sigma state, because lambda equals 0 in the sigma state. S is equal to a half. J is equal to N plus or minus 1 half then. The rotational term energies are spin split, and they're denoted by an F, so a lot of times, this, isn't the, this is not, I love how should I put it, not every molecule uses this notation for F, but in OH they do, in the A state. F1 is uh, for N plus a half, and F2 uh, is for N minus a half. So those are the energy levels for those rotational states, spin split. So the, uh, the energy levels are then given by this. Looks fairly familiar. There's the, the B with the vibrational correction, second term. And then this term here, which we'll talk about in a minute. So here's what the energy levels in the A state look like. Now, the A state is an excited state, right? So this is the uh, this le energy level here in wave numbers represents the uh, energy of the A state, the electronic energy level above zero. We're going to call the uh, X state zero, OK? So here is uh, V prime equals zero, here's V prime equals one. So what I'm showing here are rotational levels within V prime equals zero, okay? And you see them rising up there as J goes up, and it's spin split. So those are the F1 and F2s. You see that the spin splitting is actually fairly weak. That term gamma in those equations for F1 and F2 is a spin splitting constant with a very small value, okay, but you see it's going up as we go up in J or in N. So spin, the spin splitting term gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we go up in J and it becomes more noticeable. And this, uh, okay, here this P is the parity. And you remember that parity is going to control uh, whether a transition is allowed or not, so it's important to, I mean, somehow they're going to have to tell you whether a transition is allowed or not, and that's one way to do it. Okay, let's go to the ground state. Now, this is what I think is interesting. The, uh, the ground state electronic term energy is spin split, and it's written differently. It's written this way. So A is a spin orbit coupling constant, given by that for OH. But the splitting is a constant value. It's not going to increase with J as it did before. Lambda equals 1, S equals a half. The OHX state follows Hunt's case A at low rotational uh, quantum numbers and then switches to B at higher. So this is an example of the fact that even though we've, we've gone into all kinds of gory details about uh, coupling, we still didn't really have it right. Okay, here's a molecule that behaves a little bit like one of them and then switches over and behaves a little bit like the other one. So even though we, w we launched off on this detailed discussion about coupling, we still don't have it right. 
But this is a way to keep track of all the, what this is really, how should I put it, a theoretically informed way to keep track of the behavior that's been observed. We use uh, uh, B K, uh, case B notation, though, even though at, uh, at low uh, uh, rotational quantum numbers it's, uh, it looks like Hunt's case A. So the rotational term energies become more complicated. And uh, this thing is split, so you get two different uh, term level energies. Now we look at this. Uh, the, the x state is down at 0, and we're looking in the first vibrational level again. And you can see a very strong splitting that starts to go away as we go up. These lines are also lambda doubled, but often it goes undetected. So it's usually considered a degeneracy. Notice that the progression of lines along this axis, we're still just worrying about this axis here. They don't look like the IR uh, spectra because band heads are formed. And that's because of what I was talking about before. The line positions are given this way. And the formulas can change significantly between the X and A states. And there are some negative numbers inside those term energies. And so you can get a progression that starts in one direction, turns around, and goes the other direction, which is what causes the band heads. So my main message is that these simple models uh, uh, have to be made more complex, and they involve a lot of details, because what we're really trying to do is find a way to explain what we're observing spectrally. And it's, it's actually a very good way to catalog what somebody has observed. So I got my other point is, I think that's the next point, yeah. If you're going to go after a molecule that other people haven't studied, or you're going to go wandering into a spectral region people haven't used, or something like that, you have to pay very close attention to what's going on to make sure you get the numbers correct. Um, and that means you have to sit down and read all these things. So typically, people who do spectroscopy have you know, a huge file of papers on the particular molecule that they're studying. So they understand exactly how that molecule behaves and how to describe that. But like I said before, if you're, if you're following an accepted practice, if you're following some prescription that's been written, you, you, it's okay to just go ahead and, and uh, do it well, but just follow the prescription somebody else has written. <coughs> Molecules with more than two atoms, they're called polyatomics, and they're very important in combustion. There are more lines, and, and the trouble with a polyatomic, like a, like a triatomic, people have studied triatomics with uh, uh, laser diagnostics in the past, but they're, they're, they're significantly weaker because they have many, many, many more vibrational and rotational lines, which means that Boltzmann statistics are going to kill you. The populations in each one of those lines is going to be down by one or two orders of magnitude, and that's going to kill the signal. So there are only a few triatomics people have succeeded in seeing. It, it works better if you're doing it in absorption, where you, you're looking across a significant line of sight, say especially if you're doing some way to improve the absorption signal. People have done that. Um, for laser-induced fluorescence, it's pretty tough. Depends on the molecule. Um, so uh, those aren't so easy. And those really have, uh, like HCO, that's, a, that's a, an extremely important molecule. You can actually hit that hard with 355 nanometers, broadband, and you can hit a bunch of lines, and you can get LIF from that. So there are molecules you can do that with. Some, oh yeah, I just said that. Uh, there are also fuel tracers. Those are extremely complex molecules, like ketones like acetone or pentanone. Those have a strong response. Um, their spectra are very broad. I mean, we've been talking about these, these well, here's, I'll just use this picture. We've been talking about these stick spectra, right? Something like uh, one of those ketones is going to be just very, very broad, sort of like that. There, you won't see a lot of structure. That's because there are so many lines, and they're broadened, and they all just sort of overlap and add up. And, and so there's a, there's a fairly uniform response uh, across a, a broad range of wavelengths. So people typically use those, and they just you know, nail it somewhere with the laser. And the, strong, the response is strong enough that you can, you can see the, uh, you, can, you can do imaging, for example. 
And I think I said that, that acetone is the one molecule where I've actually been able to see the PLIF with my own eyeballs. So you can do that. Um, the spectrum is complex. Uh, uh, it looks just like a hump. Sometimes that hump shifts with temperature. And if it's been carefully characterized, like uh, uh, pentanone, for example, is a tracer that people use to measure temperature because they, they see that it shifts. What's really happening is populations, whenever you measure temperature using spectroscopy, what you're using is Boltzmann statistics. You're looking at a change in the ratio between lines because the populations have moved because of the temperature. That's also what's happening here. It's just that the spectrum is so dense, you don't see individual lines. So with a, with a tracer like that, what happens is it'll move over, and that's because these lines are moving to higher J levels or higher V levels and things because it's, it's absorbing more energy. So you can, you can do imaging of temperature uh, using some tracers because of that. Uh, the tracers, of course, if they start to burn, then you lose them and you can't see the temperature anymore. But uh, they're really good for getting pictures like inside an engine if you want to see the the temperature distribution in the chamber. Like in the old days of HCCI engines, that was homogeneous charge compression ignition engines, they tried to create a homogeneous field of fuel air mixture and they would put a tracer in there like that. And, and this was compression ignited, so they wanted to see what was happening to the temperature distribution in the engine right before ignition. Well, a tracer like that's perfect. It'll tell you is, is the temperature distribution uniform or are there hot spots or what's happening. So for really big molecules like a soot precursor, uh, people discovered that you can get, uh, uh, actually this is an interference, people, people discovered, oh, it must have been in the 90s, that, uh, or maybe the 80s, that the, the green light from a frequency doubled YAG or something like that, or an argon laser, would, would produce fluorescence from PAHs. And so they started trying to find ways to image PAHs, but the trouble is, um, you can you can cause other reactions like laser induced incandescence of soot at exactly the same time so a lot of interferences and you're not sure what you're really looking at so i honestly think that if you want to look at something that's really big like that and you want to know what's the concentration it's probably best to just sample that and use a mass spectrometer or something like that that you reach a point where um, laser diagnostics are not all that helpful so as I, as I was explaining before, lines, more and more lines appear and the species become uh, very involved, it becomes crowded. They start to broaden and the optical field starts to look thick and this is what I talked about before. Ultimately, when you get a bunch of these put together and, and they all get broadened out, the thing starts to look like a Planck black body distribution and you don't see as much detail. And I said this before, if we combine the equation of radiative transfer with statistical mechanics, uh, that's actually interesting. It was Einstein. Einstein said, uh, so it was Planck who, who first said he, uh, uh, he thought maybe, was it Planck? Oh, now I'm getting the stories all mixed up. No, it was Planck who was angry about it. It was Boltzmann who was proposing that, he was the one who first proposed that uh, statistical, we had to use statistics to describe these things. And Planck didn't like it at all, and uh, it was Einstein who said, Einstein, Einstein was really angry, and he said, God does not play dice. He was just really adamant about that, that you can't, we can't, this is, this has to, Einstein insisted it had to be deterministic, it can't be statistical. And, but the only way Planck could actually describe the black body distribution was with statistics. There was no other way to theoretically describe uh, the black body distribution without using statistical mechanics. And that's when people started to, and Planck didn't want to do it. He saw that as his last resort. He was embarrassed that he was forced into this, but it was the only way to do it and he did it. And so people began to accept statistical mechanics. But anyway, you can do that. You can take all of these different spectral structures uh, and build them into a black body distribution using statistical mechanics. So speaking of that, I think we're going to have a break then. We're a little bit early, but let's have a break. And when we come back, we have to talk about stat thermo, resonance response, and line shapes. And then uh, that'll be done for our Bhutan march through, uh, through molecular dynamics. So we come back in uh, 15 minutes, I guess. <laughs>